All right, going to do a real quick video here answering Stephen Anderson's little funny thing there in his sermon, if you want to call it a sermon, his little show that he puts on there. Um, I get all these people sending me links to this thing. I don't even know how many. And so you know, get a, got to respond, got to respond, got to respond. Uh, that's what's been going on for the last couple of years. Okay, um, Stephen Anderson makes a lot of noise, and uh, a lot of people say, you know, nobody can refute him and things like that. People have said to me, could you please do some videos refuting him? So that's one of the points that uh, Anderson brings up. He says that I'm obsessed with him. Uh, I'm obsessed with truth, okay, and defending truth and defending against liars like Stephen Anderson. But, uh, you know, he'll do 50 points, uh, post-trib moments, 50 marching design moments or whatever else, whatever they were called, I hate the Jew moments, whatever. And um, you know, he hates the Jews, although we're the Jews, you know, it's funny. But, uh, and then, you know, people say, could you refute each one? Well, I do. That's why the videos really stack up. But uh, I saw early on um, this thing of Stephen Anderson. I heard about him right when I was first in ministry. And his big claim to fame was uh, getting beat up by Border Patrol guys, and he's on InfoWars. And at the time, I really wasn't aware of what InfoWars was all about. It's uh, disinfo is the whole thing. It's... Um, uh, sort of a COINTELPRO, um, I forget what you, uh, counterinsurgency kind of a thing. In other words, they come out, they tell some truth, but they're spinning it. Okay. Psyops, can you talk? Psyops, yeah. Psychological warfare. My wife's sitting over here to my right. Um, but, you know, that's what the thing is. So the fact that Steven Anderson would be on a show like that, that has very wicked people, that, uh, you know, they, they bring... When you come back from their commercial advertising, there's heavy metal and rock and roll and stuff like that. Kind of a strange place for a Bible believer to be, Bible-believing Christian. But that was his big claim to fame. A very common tactic within the military intelligence field. You do some kind of a thing, you know, a guy gets beat up or something, and then all of a sudden he's a big star. And so I saw this guy, this Stephen Anderson, that he was a danger to true Bible-believing Christians, uh, very early on, and a lot of his stands are those that Roman Catholics take. That's why I've called him a Jesuit. Getting ahead of myself here, but um, and it wasn't just me that says that either. So I'll be talking about that here in a couple of minutes. But I'm just going to make a couple of points here. Uh, I thought it was interesting. It's like Brian Dillinger versus Stephen Anderson, kind of like you know, he'd actually have the guts to take me on, which he doesn't. Um, but then he says, "I'm going to give him a pulpit mention. He's earned it." Who do you think you are, Stephen Anderson? You know, are you that prideful? You're, you're some big shot that, you know, I'm just worthy now finally to have you actually mention my name. See, the guy's got a major pride issue. You know, oh, he's worthy of a pulpit mention. Hey, I name names and I tell what's going on with people. And it's not about, oh, I'm going to honor them because they've attacked this or they've attacked that. No. You know, I'll go after people and name them by name. But I, I'm supposed to be honored, I guess, or something, that this little uh, false convert here um, mentioned my name from his pulpit. You know, ooh, like it's a big thing or something. And again, you know, I have a couple of points written down here. I, I did watch the video, and it was pretty much what I expected. Anderson's not really much of a surprise to me. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, oh, he made all these videos, two to three hundred videos about me. Yeah, because you're making 50 videos and things that I'm refuting each one, you know. And again, I have been warning people about infiltrators getting into the King James Bible believing movement. And I said, I've made videos about that. How can you spot? Are they infiltrators or not? And there are certain stands that are very important to the Vatican, extremely important to the Vatican. All right, talk about that here in a minute. Um, but I see this thing and I see very, very vile, wicked people promoting Stephen Anderson, his films being created by Paul Wittenberger. Who works for Hollywood? Isn't that contrary? You know, I mean, I've had offers from people to help me with video production and stuff, and I'm like, I'm sorry, no, no, I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm not about professional video in terms of Hollywood level. I do my best with what the Lord gives us, but I'm not here to entertain you. Okay, I'm here to preach the word. Uh, again, he says about what proof does he have that I'm part of the Jesuit? The Jesuit claim, you know, he's saying I'm a Jesuit. He doesn't offer any proof. 
Well, I've offered plenty of proof. Uh, one of the bigger ones is my interview with Eric John Phelps, the world's renowned authority on the Jesuit order, and he said that Stephen Anderson is a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. If you don't know what that means, the Catholic Church works in two realms, the spiritual and the temporal. Okay, the spiritual would be the their church. Okay, the temporal would be within the governments. See, the Catholic Church, the Vatican there, the Vatican State, runs things. Anybody who's a Catholic is first and foremost a member of the Vatican, a citizen of the Vatican, of the Roman system. Okay, that's why they run things. That's the temporal. The spiritual is what they would deem as religion. So a Jesuit temporo coadjutor is somebody who works not in open Catholicism, not as a priest or whatever else. They work in the temporal realm. Be they working in uh, politics or, or Baptist churches or whatever. And a coadjutor is somebody that helps the purposes of the Jesuits. Okay, so they get orders from Jesuit, uh, high-ranking Jesuits, and they'll say, okay, do this and do that. And they might, again, they might not be openly, you know, like Roman Catholic Jesuits. They could be some guy like Roland Rasmussen. I believe he's probably a high-level Jesuit. Uh, there's some really interesting stuff about that guy. But Eric Phelps said he believes that Stephen Anderson is a Jesuit temporal coadjutor. I have the interview. You can, you can watch that. So it's not just my opinion. Okay. And uh, again, why would I call Stephen Anderson a Jesuit? Well, let's look, at the, let's look at the evidence here. Replacement theology. Replacement theology has been taught by Catholics for well over a thousand years. Okay. Um, the, the church has replaced Israel. That's a Roman Catholic teaching. That's not a teaching of the New Testament. Again, I've debunked that. I've preached plenty of sermons on that. And when I defend Israel, I'm defending them as God has a plan for them in the future. I'm not saying that they're saved. I'm not saying if you're a Jew and you're born in Israel, you're automatically on your way to heaven. Uh-uh. Jesus Christ. You have to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That's there. And we'll be talking more about that in just a little bit here as far as the Jew thing. But... He teaches replacement theology. He teaches that the church has to go through this, at least the first part of the tribulation, uh, which is absolute uh, Vatican-based. And again, some little knucklehead's going to say, well, the Jesuit, uh, what was the guy's name, Ribeiro or something like this, uh, uh, Manuel Lacunza, you know, and all this stuff. Oh, he wrote this, the, the pre-trib thing. That's nonsense. Okay, if a Jesuit wrote it, it would be pointing people towards the church goes through this time, not that it escapes. Because, see, the pre-trib rapture doctrine absolutely destroys Roman Catholicism. Absolutely. Because, you see, Roman Catholics are taught if you're a faithful member of the church, then you're probably saved. <laughs> you know, uh, that's what they teach. But, see, if the rapture happens, it would sort all that stuff out, just like that. And, by the way, Christians would go up to be with the Lord without ever going through purgatory. And again, I've done a whole study on that, so I'm not going to get into it all here. But the quote-unquote pre-trib rapture um, totally destroys Roman Catholic teaching, Roman Catholic doctrine. So again, Stephen Anderson teaching against the rapture is showing who his masters really are. And, you know, there's so many other things. And you say, but he uses the King James Bible. So do the Masons. So do Masonic Lodges. That doesn't prove anything. The Mormons use the King James Bible. Okay, there's a lot of fakes that use the King James Bible. Doesn't prove a thing. But uh, what about the? Uh, he says, "Oh, uh, you know, where does where does Brian Dunninger go to church?" Oh, uh, well, I'm a King James Bible believing Christian, so the term I look through my Bible and I say, "Where does it say go to church?" Hey, Anderson, uh, where does it say go to church in the King James Bible? I'd like you to tell me a verse. Okay, you tell me a verse. It says go to church and I'll move from Maine to Arizona and come to your church every week. Just show me one verse that says go to church, that wording. Show me one. Okay? Or any of your little followers too. Any of your little devil-possessed followers. Show me a verse that says go to church. Okay? I'll be waiting. And you can talk about my attitude and, and all this and that, whatever else, you know. Show it to me. Okay? Simple. Um, and again, you have this, this Catholic mindset that the church is a holy building someplace that you go to and you dress up in your Sunday best and you put on the production every week. 
Uh, that's not in the New Testament. Completely foreign to the New Testament. Again, Roman Catholic, pushing Roman Catholic faults. Right? But, oh, you know, well, we need to inspect his fruit, the fruit of, of, you know, things there, so we need to be able to come to his church someplace. Um, maybe you ought to just go to my main channel page and look at the website that's there on my main channel page here on YouTube. It says uh, King James Video Ministries. Okay? I don't pastor a church. I'm in video ministry. You might want to write that down, okay? You know, just pause the video and take your time writing video ministry so it can sink into the head up here. All right? I mean, okay. Um, but the big thing here, you know, at the end he plays this little clip from one of his little followers, probably cut out part of the sermon. They never discuss the fact that the whole thing, I'm defending eternal security, eternal security, eternal security, and I'm like, Romans 11, Revelation 3, verse 5, Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. And I honestly, so I was honest and I said, I don't know. It looks to me like this is somebody that was saved and they're losing their salvation. I'm honest. Do I teach eternal security? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And I get people all the time. I get Christians writing me, you know, and stuff. And brother, brother Brian, I'm, I'm having problems with pornography. I'm having problems with alcohol. I'm pro having problems with whatever, whatever, whatever. Am I saved? And I, you know, say, well, did you this? Did you that? You know, uh, you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Yes. You know, was there a change in your life? Yes. But brother, I'm still struggling with this thing. Then you're saved. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. You say, well, then what about these uh, supposed two exceptions? Well, let's look at them. See, I'm actually going to turn you to the, the scriptures here. I'm not going to do like Stephen Anderson and just simply go, oh, he's a heretic. He teaches this. Now, now don't don't bother looking at the context in which he's saying things in the video. Let's look at this. Because he's, you know, oh, he says that because I hate the Jews, then I'm not saved. Yeah, that's right. Let's look at that. Romans chapter 11. Uh, verse 16, we'll start there. Okay? It says here, For the, if the first, first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Right? It's talking about Israel there. And if some of the branches be broken off, what's that? Some of the branches are broken off. Those are Jews. And thou being a wild olive tree, wert graft in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. I believe Jesus Christ is the root there. All right? And the branches that come up are... It's the nation of Israel. And those branches are broken off. Why? They didn't put their faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't accept him as their Messiah. Now, if you're one of Stephen Anderson's followers or Stephen Anderson, would you say that the branches are saved? It says right there about being broken off. Verse 17. They're no longer connected to the root. Are they saved or are they lost? Simple question. They're lost. Look at verse 19. Thou wilt say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Hmm. So, let me ask the question again. Are the branches saved or lost? They're lost. Obviously. Because of unbelief they were broken off. They're not saved. Now, all you uh, Jew-hating Anderson followers there, wouldn't you agree that the Jews are broken off right now because of unbelief? Would you agree with that? Sure you would. Absolutely. Verse 21. Notice at the end of verse 20 there it says, Be not high-minded, but fear. Verse 21. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Now, what does that mean? It's comparing them to the branches that were broken off. 
See, this is the kind of stuff shallow little preachers like Anderson won't ever, ever even cover. They don't understand this stuff. He's lost. He can't understand the scriptures. All right. He, there's no, there's no, been no repentance. It's just this little, I prayed a prayer in salvation or in Sunday school when I was a little boy and then I've been saved ever since. That doesn't work that way. I did the same thing. Okay. I was a false convert until uh, I was 25 years old, until I was uh, finally broken. My self righteous pride was broken. And then I truly came to God in the correct state of being a broken sinner. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. You're not going to get saved until you are broken and say, I'm a sinner. And don't give me this nonsense. Well, sinners can't, you know, lost people can't understand that they're sinners. Please, please. Yes, they can. They absolutely can. All right. But notice there. Look at the verse. If God spared not the natural branches, we saw that they were broken off because of unbelief. Take heed lest he also spare not thee. I've had some of the brethren, they write, and they say, well, brother, that's talking about national cutting off a nation from the blessings of God. Uh, in context, that's not what it's talking about, brethren. I realize that the early part of the book of Romans chapter 11, it's talking about the nation of Israel. That's true. But you're switching here to branches, natural branches, people. And the, in your King James Bible, is a reference to a singular person. It's a warning to a singular Christian. Each one of us has to take heed to this warning. So I approach it and I just say, honestly, I don't know. This is up to God to decide. But I do know one thing. I've never met one single true born-again Christian that's ever been a hater of the Jewish people. That would ever side with Muslims against the nation of Israel occupying the land that's rightfully theirs. And yet I see this with Anderson's people all the time. Oh, they're fake Jews. They're fake Jews and everything else. I say, so the Jews in Israel are fake? Yeah, the Jews over there in Israel are fake. Wait a second. How can they be fake Jews and yet Jews in Israel? Shouldn't you just call them something else? It's too much over the head of them people. But, but that's the thing right there. Okay? You mess around with Israel, you mess around with that, and, and, and you say, well, why would that be such a big deal to God? Well, think about it. God made a promise to Abraham and to his seed, all right, a perpetual covenant that's going to be fulfilled one day in the time of Jacob's trouble. You read about that down further in Romans chapter 11. The time of Jacob's trouble, they get whipped. It's for Israel, you know, the time of Jacob's trouble. They get whipped by God for seven years, and then at the end of that, Jesus Christ returns and rules and reigns from Jerusalem and restores that city. All right? You understand that? But what if the Jews have been replaced? See, that's why that teaching is so important to Roman Catholicism. Because they want you to believe the Jews are no more. You know why? Because if, they, if that's true, then God's a liar. God made a promise to Abraham and to his physical seed. His physical seed. You say, how do you know? Romans chapter 11, verse 1. I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. When you're reading about the Jews... There in the book of Romans, you know, I'll show you another good one. This because this is where the little Anderson snake zombies will go to. Romans chapter two. Um, verse 28 and 29. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Boink, stop. Let's go on to the next point. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's keep reading, why don't we? Chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Wait a second. Um, it's talking about physical Jews. That's a shame. Okay? Paul's relating spiritual things in chapter 2, verses 28 and 29. Then he goes back to the physical Yes, the Jews have not been cast away as a people. It's God's purpose. That's why replacement theology is so satanic. That's why Revelation 2.9 and Revelation 3.9 both say about, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. 
It's talking about people like Stephen Anderson. God makes them of the synagogue of Satan. Now, if you want to say that they're losing their salvation and they're being totally given over to the synagogue of Satan at that point, I don't know. I don't know. I know not to mess with it. I know God has plans for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, and I ain't going to mess with it. I meet Jews. I get in conversations with Jews all the time on, online. I've blocked them from my channel. Some of them are just so obstinate and just so arrogant and everything else. And they just attack the Lord and you know, the Lord Jesus Christ. I block them. I'll ban them. And yet you get these you know, re replacement theology Catholic followers of Anderson and they're going, you were, you're a Jew worshiper. You look like a Jewish rabbi. You know, and all this stuff. You worship Jews. Well, if I worship them, then why am I banning them from my channel? I've had to ban a couple of them. But let me show you another one here. Uh, trying to think of where this one's at. Revelation, is it? Yeah, Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. Okay, here's the other one. All right, there's actually three that I brought up in that study on eternal security. And again, Anderson didn't show these to his people there. Revelation chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Um, how can you have your name blotted out of the book of life if it was never in the book of life? You know, I'll do it this way. Okay, a little piece of paper here. I'll write Stephen... Anderson. All right. There it is at the top of the page. Oh, he's messing with the Jews, messing with God's word, changing God's word, which he's done. What am I doing? I'm blotting out his name. Little eraser on the end of my pencil there. His name's gone. You say, well, his name was never there. How did I blot it out if it was never there? The whole Bible teaches eternal security. The Bible centers itself around Baptist doctrine. <laughs> yeah. If you're about crazy and insane in the head, or lost, again, you can't understand the Word of God. Revelation chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Okay, now I'll do this again like I did it in my study. Okay, you see, yellow paper, yellow pad here thing. It's in the Bible, right? I just took it out. You say, well, it was always in there. No, for me to take it, or it was never in there, I should say. For me to take it out of the book of life, it had to first be in. Okay? Read Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, where it talks about Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if your part is taken out of the book of life, as it says there in verse 19, uh, where was it first? And you know, I mean, you can debate this stuff. People say, well, brother, maybe it was originally there from the foundation of the world. You know, they do this, uh, what is it, equidistant letter sequencing or something like this, every sixth letter of every fourth verse or something, and it spells out a name and... I don't mess with that stuff, to be honest with you. Um, people say, well, you know, um, you know, well, it, it could be that everybody that's ever been created, their name is found someplace with letter sequencing or something like this. Yeah, but uh, they don't all mess with God's Word. They're not all adding to and subtracting from God's Word. So it would seem kind of weird that you have to somehow commit that sin to go to hell or something. No, you, you go to hell because you reject Jesus Christ. All right. So it, I'm just looking at the Bible and I'm saying, that's what I see. Do I teach eternal security? Yes, I do. Uh, I will continue to teach it. Why? Because Christians that I've met, 
Bible-believing, born-again Christians that I've met, they don't mess with the book, and they don't mess with the Jews. So, you know, I believe in eternal security. Absolutely. You get somebody messing around with the flesh and stuff like that, yeah, sure. God's going to ch chastise them. He's going to punish them. But they're not going to lose their salvation. And I'll defend eternal security. Absolutely. What about these two verses? It's areas that I don't think Bible-believing Christians would mess with. And if you get so messed up that you get over into that realm, God have mercy on your soul. So that is my answer here. Just wanted to do this thing very quickly. Um, uh, you know, I am going to continue to attack anybody who comes out and tries to get into the King James Bible believing movement and tries to uh, make us look like a bunch of blabbering idiots. Uh, it gets out there and calls for the president's death and to, for the execution of sodomites and things like that. I had somebody ask a question, actually. It was a pretty good question. They said, uh, why is it that you say that pedophiles should be executed, but yet sodomites shouldn't be? Well, because uh, 1 Corinthians, where are we at here? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, uh, talks about effeminate, verse 9 there, abusers of themselves with mankind, talks about those two groups, and then it says in verse 11, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So sodomites can be saved. Right? And I do believe that there are some that have gotten saved and gotten away from it. But only if they turn from that sinful life, you see. That's why I teach repentance. I don't just say anybody can come and get saved by just simply believing and just, just say a prayer and you're magically saved. Uh, you don't have to have any conviction of your sin or, or any repentance state there or whatever. I don't teach that. That's heresy. Right? But if, you, if you're teaching easy believism, if you teach it's just a prayer that you, that you say or whatever, then any sodomite church out there, they're filled with saved people. Now, I had a sodomite you know, guy the one time, and he was like, you know, supposedly Christian. He's an easy believism heretic. Joseph Deering was his name. And, um, and he was actually a sodomite too, by the way. And he was like, well, show me one gay church that has a clear plan of salvation. I sent him a link to three. Salvation by faith in Jesus. Sodomite websites. Sodomite churches. Openly sodomite churches. LGBT, all this junk. You know? But you see, what I'm saying is, right here, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 says, sodomites can get saved. Such were some of you. Notice that in verse 11? Their lives changed. They're born again. New creature. You see? But show me in the New Testament where it says the same thing for somebody that molests children. I think when you're getting into that realm of molesting children, I think you're gone. I think you're finished. So, that's going to be it. I've said enough. Um, Anderson, if you're going to be stupid and, and I mean, just, just I'll, I want you to come out of the confessional. Just admit that you're a Catholic. I'll leave you alone. You don't see me going after a Catholic priest very often or whatever. Uh, why? Well, because I realize that anybody who's born again can instantly see through a Catholic priest. They just go, yeah, pfft. False. Somebody that's born again can look at a James White and go, yep, get out, sorry. You know, they're false. But you're coming in and you're messing with the group that I'm part of. And I don't appreciate that. And so I'm going to keep hunting you and I'm going to keep exposing you and anybody else that joins with you. You're a fake, you're a fraud. Okay, that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.